transition memos, postscripts, and all the attachments have also been declassified, and they've been put up on a website maintained at the, pres off the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. And the hope is that the book plus that digital archive is a place where people can go to try to find out and write and research the administration's foreign policy. Transitions are important because they are a vulnerable time, um, particularly if there are ongoing military operations, ongoing diplomatic negotiations. You want to have a bit of handover so that pieces are not dropped. There are also situations where our allies are nervous that we might be inattentive to the crisis of the moment, and our adversaries might think we're in preoccupied and then try to take advantage of it. So what I think is America has become more engaged in the world, these transitions from one administration to another, they've become more and more important. And the issue is, can you put the incoming administration in a position so day one, they're able to assume the responsibilities that are theirs when they come into office? So this allows me to say it's worse than that. And I don't know if you remember this, but I used to say that all the time when I was working for you and you said that's gonna be on my tombstone uh, when my, that epitaph. But it's not just that it's difficult to hand off when geopolitical uh, situation is rough, but the way the US government hands uh, swaps personnel is complicates it as well and you've seen that in previous administrations so talk a little bit about it it's counterintuitive the the process the u.s national security establishment particularly at the white house goes through can you talk about that well one of the things about how we do business in this country that's fairly unique <clears throat> is we elect a president president then picks a cabinet and underneath the cabinet level there are deputy secretaries undersecretaries and assistant secretaries, great numbers, thousands of folks. Uh, and they all, many of them, have to be Senate confirmed. And that, of course, takes time. People have to prepare their papers, submit the papers, there have to be hearings, there has to be a vote. So one of the problems is as good a transition as you can do, people are actually many times not in their positions until April or May of the first year of administration, which means you've lost almost half a year. And one of the things we've done over the last couple of administrations is try to accelerate that process of getting people named and appointed and in transition. The NSC is a little different. You can, people there are not Senate confirmed, so you can bring them in more quickly. Why do we have that chunk of people between the cabinet secretaries and then the permanent government, the civil service, the military, and the foreign service? They have an uh, unusual role in our system. They are to intermediate between the political agenda of the president that comes out of the elections. Presidents campaign on something, they get elected on a platform, they feel an obligation to implement that platform. That's what those, that layer of political appointees do. But they also do something else. They intermediate between that political agenda and the expertise and history of the permanent government. And if we do it right, there is an interaction there that comes out with sustainable policies for the United States. So it's different uh, in the way our, our country does it. I think it's better, but it has lag times in there. It means I was Deputy National Security Advisor. I didn't have my first deputies meeting with a deputy who was appointed by the Bush administration and Senate confirmed until May. That's a long time to wait, especially since we didn't know the, then that but 9-11 was virtually right around the corner. And it's worse even than that, because there's also the Presidential Records Act, which uh, in previous uh, administrations created havoc. So can you talk a little bit about that? So I, I'm, I'm an old person, in case you hadn't noticed, and I was in the uh, one month in the Nixon administration, then in the Ford administration, and then one month in the Carter administration. So my first transition was from the Ford administration to the Carter administration. So I left my last day in the Ford administration. I, I, I closed the door in my office. My office had lots of filing cabinets full of papers, classified papers, intelligence reports on all the issues I was working on. And I then came in the next day, the first day of the Carter administration as a Carter administration appointee, and all my safes were empty because all the documents are presidential records and they went 
to the Ford Presidential Library. So Zbigniew Brzezinski comes in to be National Security Advisor for the Carter administration. One, he has no staff because they fired everybody except three or four of us. And there are no documents at all in the old executive office building where the NSC offices are because they've all gone to, the, to Gerald Ford's museum. And so far as I know, there were no memos prepared for the incoming administration. That's where we started. That is unacceptable. And one of the things I thought I would try to do in my career is see if we could fix that. And, and I belabored that, or I pushed you on that because that explains why not just the memos that were here, but also the supporting documents, the tele memorandums of conversation that the president had, things that may not be known if even from a very attentive uh, reader of current affairs might not know the private correspondence that have been happening and that information was necessary for President Obama's team. It was, there's, there's two steps. One is you try to prepare a transition and you give the new team what you think they need to perform their jobs. The question is whether the new team's gonna read it. Because <laughs> you know, you go it through a presidential election, you win the presidency, your adrenaline is flowing and you think, boy, we, this is our moment. Those people who were here before, you know, they didn't know what they're doing. Finally, the grown-ups have arrived. And I think administrations have a tendency to sort of reject that which came from the administration before on the ground. It wasn't invented here, so it must not be make sense. And you have this sense that you're writing on a you're writing history on a clean sheet of paper. And that is profoundly not true. Because each administration stands on the successes and failures of its predecessors. And those successes and failures will limit its options. It'll give them some opportunities, it'll give them some burdens. And similarly, you don't realize when you're in office that the things, many of the things you are starting will only succeed if they're picked up by the next administration because you don't have time within the space of four or eight years to get it done. So you're beholding to those who came before and in some sense hostage to those who came after. Uh, I don't think people uh, pay that much enough attention to that fact. The other thing that mitigates against the transition, when the new team comes in, you are incredibly busy. You know, you're getting your people in place, you're trying to learn the issues, you're getting to know your counterparts in the interagency. There's not a lot of time. And I think one of the things that we've done is to try to move backwards or move earlier in the process as much of the transition as you can because people have more time before the election and before they get into office than they do once they're in their positions. So when you went down to the library and reread the memos, uh, sort of in one sitting as it were, what was your takeaway? You already said you thought they stood up pretty well, but as you step back and reviewed the, the, the sweep of foreign policy, what were some of the big takeaways that you, ha you had from that exercise? There are a lot of things. Um, one is the rap on the Bush administration, of which there are a lot. One of them is all you did was Iraq, Afghanistan, and the war on terror, and you didn't do any of those very well. Uh, in fact, one of the things American people need to know, and you see it if you just read the table of contents, your government is dealing with 30 or 40 issues that deal with foreign relations of the United States all at the same time. You have to with the United States. They are, we are too big a global player and too many things happening overseas affect us here at home. So it's not just the Bush administration that was dealing with these whole range of issues. Any administration has to do. That's one lesson Americans should, should take away from this. Second, as I read the memos, one of the things that struck me was how many times new initiatives either came from the president or were conceptualized by the president when the, somebody else had the idea and many times had to be implemented by direct action by the president. Uh, I've, it led me to conclude what I say that the president, whoever he or she is, is the chief strategy officer for their administration. And it is amazing how much depends on the president in terms of implementation, innovation and implementation. And then the third thing I think that struck me is how uh, in the Bush administration, and it is still, I think, largely true today, 
Yes, the Chinese are more active. Yes, they brokered a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Yes, they want to try to broker a peace between Russia and Ukraine. We'll see how far they get with that. But the truth is that in the international arena, not much happens if the United States does not take some initiative. And there are a whole series of initiatives in this book which the president had a hand in, which became national programs, and which the president then took on the road and sold to our closest allies in the G7 or the G20 uh, or uh, at the United Nations, or put together ad hoc coalitions of sometimes uh, 130 or 140 countries. We came up with something called the Proliferation Security Initiative to disrupt the movement of nuclear and other uh, weapons of mass destruction to terrorist groups. It ended up having 140 countries working together. So this unilateral President Bush actually used national programs to forge international coalitions, and it's needed. Those coalitions are needed, and if the United States doesn't take a lead, they won't happen. The last thing I would say, and we'll probably want to talk about this, is when you read the transition memos on China and Russia, you see how different the China and Russia that we face today is from the China and Russia that Bush faced during his administration. And then I guess the last thing that strikes you is how different the world is today, and even was in 2008, from the world we inherited in 2000 when, when Bush uh, was elected president. But we can talk about that. So I wanna pick that second theme and push it a little further because I think that's counterintuitive especially for people who haven't worked closely with the Bush administration or, or weren't alive, you know, or weren't politically aware during the Bush administration. Some of my younger students have no memories of that except for what they've read uh, in, uh, in assignments, for instance. And they'd be surprised to hear, one, that the president was all that strategic, maybe. Uh, and secondly, they might be surprised at the implementation aspect of what you said, because, okay, I'll buy it that the president has the idea, but everyone else has to do the implementa implementation. So develop that a little bit further, particularly for a skeptical audience, maybe. I'll give just a couple examples. Um, so in 2008, the president, the president was a great reader. A lot of surprises, a lot of people. Uh, he and Karl Rove had a competition about how many books they could read in a year. And I think one year it was 80 books or something like that. And one of the books the president read was about the Spanish flu pandemic in the 1920s. And Bush read the book, came in the next morning, went down to Fran Townsend's office, who was the Homeland Security Advisor, and said, we need a plan to deal with pandemics. And you've got 60 days. <laughs> uh, now that's a presidential initiative. And we came up with a plan uh, which was available to the Obama administration. They took some advantage of it, uh, when, and the Trump administration as well, when COVID hit. That's an example of an, an initiative that came right from the President of the United States. Another one is the, the initiative with respect to HIV AIDS. When we came into office, the intelligence community said that HIV AIDS was going to take out probably two-thirds of the middle class in a number of countries in Africa. It's going to kill tens of millions of people and was going to set back economic development in Africa generations. So Condi Rice and Mike Gerson came to the president and said, Mr. President, this is what the data shows. We got to do something about this. So the president turned to Josh Bolton and said, okay, we're going to do something about it. Come up with a plan. He gave, I think, 60 days again. 60 days was a magic number for the president. And Josh came back with Gary Edson and the plan in about 60 days and briefed to the president. The president said, not good enough, not ambitious enough. Go back and do it again. So they came back with another plan. This one was $15 billion over five years. Doesn't sound like much money now, but in those days it was a big chunk of change. And that program, which the president then took to the G7 and took to a broader international coalition, has to date saved 25 million lives in Africa. So this is the president's sort of taking an idea and then conceptualizing it and bringing it. And the last one, which is an unpopular one, was the surge in, that was announced by the president in January of 2007 in Iraq, which was uh, basically 
a change in the strategy in the middle of a war that we were losing to try to turn it around as kind of the last chance to do so. And in order to implement that, he had to bring his national security team behind the surge. They were quite critical of it. He had to bring his military leaders behind it. He had to bring Nouri al-Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq, behind it. He had to bring our other coalition allies behind it. He did it all in a series of phone calls. He was the implementer of that speech. He had to sell it to the Congress, and he had to sell it to the American people when everybody expected he was going to announce that we were going to draw our troops out of Iraq, and he announces we're actually going to change our strategy and increase our troop levels. It works. It brings down the, the violence dramatically. But again, you know, it is the president who had to take that idea, sell it, and implement it, and he did. So you, the last two you mentioned just happen to be the 20th anniversaries of both of those. So let me first ask about PEPFAR, and then we're going to really drill into Iraq for a moment. Was there much opposition to PEPFAR? Was there, particularly in the Republican Party, there's a sense in which we're wasting money on foreign aid, et cetera. Uh, did the president face pushback from his own political base when he was uh, proposing such a large increase in development aid? It went over pretty well. I just saw a clip uh, on the news here a couple nights ago of the president. He announced it in the State of the Union speech, and it was a great speech. It was one of the ones that Mike Gerson who worked on, the late Mike Gerson, who was principal speechwriter, worked on. And he got a standing ovation from both parties. Uh, but he had worked that issue. One of the things he said was, I want this program to uh, extend past my administration. I wanted to be enduring, and he knew that in order to be enduring, it had to be bipartisan. It had to have buy-in from the not just the, the White House, but it had to have buy-in from the Congress. And it had to have the support of the American people, and he built that support. One of the things that's too bad is that the American people remember almost nothing about HIV AIDS and what the president, what, what the taxpayers' dollars did to make a dramatic difference in the continent of Africa. And it's too bad because it's one of the great accomplishments of the American people and the American taxpayer to do, to good, to do good in the continent of Africa. I, I just realized, is there a picture of you and Bono? Because Bono was a lead figure, public figure in that PEPFOR. There's got to be a picture of you and Bono. The, the, I want to find the, that. The, the Am I already working on that? The dean had asked me if there was some undisclosed secret about my past, and I told her I was both transparent and boring. But the truth is I'm the backup drummer for Bono. <laughs> the, President Bush went to Africa uh, late in his administration. And just talk a little bit about what that, what, because, of course, the African people understood what PEPFAR meant to them. So the... Uh, there was a great incident. There was a president of, of Tanzania, I'm pretty sure it was Tanzania, it was a man named Kikwete, who had been a great partner on HIV AIDS, on President's Malaria Initiative, which saved another 10 million lives. Um, but it was right before the election, and Kikwete and, and the president were standing on a podium, and a young African young man raised his hand and said to Kikwete, how do you feel about the possibility the Americans are going to elect the first African-American president of the United States? And Kikwete said, well, you know, the American people will do what the American people are going to do. But I would say to the new president, whoever they is, they are, that they should be as good a friend to Africa as this man right here, George W. Bush. So the Americans may not have noticed, but African leaders noticed and the African people noticed. There are an awful lot of young children in Africa who are named George W., if you can believe it. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, shift focus to on Iraq. It's the 20th anniversary this week of the, of the invasion of Iraq. You were Deputy National Security Advisor at the time. And I'm wondering, uh, I would recommend, by the way, everyone, the chapter on that, because uh, Megan O'Sullivan uh, wrote the lead uh, or had a lead role in all of that, and is a good friend of the programs as well. What was it like for you, as you were Deputy National Security Advisor on the eve of war, so take yourself back 20 years ago, what, what were you thinking at, at that time? How, how, how did it feel? 
uh, it was a, a very momentous decision. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's hard for people to recognize exactly kind of what the state of mind of the country was. And it was very much reflected in the White House. So we were hit unaware on 9-11, we're not prepared. And almost 3,000 people from over 80 countries are killed on 9-11. On and the intelligence community says, uh, this is gonna be a first of a wave of mass casualty attacks, some of which could involve weapons of mass destruction. Um, and next month in October, envelopes with white party that turns out to be anthrax poison shows up at the US Congress and congressional offices and at media offices. We don't know who's behind it. And there's, there's a, a, a lot of concern about where we were headed. And the Saddam Hussein fits in that, not because uh, he's, you know, uh, behind 9-11, nobody thought he was behind 9-11. But the problem was that we were worried, and it's, it comes in a speech that the prison gives, which is much criticized, called the access of evil speech, because he talks about Iran, North Korea, and Iraq as an access of evil. We thought everybody was gonna stumble on the word evil you know, there's Bush, you know, his religion, wearing his religion on his seat. But what they stumbled on was Axis, the same way, is there an alliance between these three countries? And that's not what we intended. What we intended to say was, these are three countries that support terror, and we believe we're developing weapons of mass destruction, and we were worried that those weapons of mass destruction would get in the hands of the terrorists. And we saw on 9-11 what 19 terrorists armed with nothing more than box cutters could do to America, Think what they could do if they had weapons of mass destruction. So that's that's sort of the what is behind the issue of Saddam Hussein. And remember, this country had been dealing with Saddam Hussein for 12 years since the end of the first Gulf War. There were 17 UN Security Council resolutions that called him out for developing weapons of mass destruction, supporting terror, tyrannizing his people, and invading his neighbors. And the last one, the 17th one, promised, called him in violation of those resolutions and promised serious consequences. We had tried over 12 years to enforce those 17 UN Security Council resolutions through sanctions, through no-fly zones, through use of military force, declaring under Bill Clinton that regime change was the policy of the American people, um, and that uh, President, uh, Bush tried to enforce it by what he called coercive diplomacy, building up our forces in the region, threatening Saddam Hussein if he did not come clean or leave the country, we would use that military force. And I think the president to this day thinks that if he had kept the coalition together, that last Security Council resolution was 15 and 0 in the Security Council and France and Russia joined, as did China, voting for that resolution. I think President Bush believes if he had held that coalition together, Saddam Hussein would either have complied or left the country. But in February of 2003, President Putin of Russia, President Chirac of France, and Chancellor Schroeder of Germany announced that under no circumstances will they authorize the use of force against Saddam Hussein. And at that point, Saddam Hussein thinks he's got to get out of jail free card, because he thinks Bush will not go to war without an 18th UN Security Council resolution, and that the French and the Russians who have permanent seats and veto power on the Security Council will prevent that resolution from being adopted. That turns out to be a miscalculation. The problem for Bush then is there, there, there he is. He's got this force that he's built up for coercive diplomacy. Coercive diplomacy has failed, and he has a choice. He can say to Saddam Hussein, okay, 17 Security Council resolutions don't mean a thing. The American credibility doesn't mean a thing. You know, we're just kidding <laughs> and pull the troops home. Saddam would very quickly come out from under sanctions. Even those investigators who confirmed that there were no weapons of mass destruction stocks in Iraq said that when Iraq was out from under sanctions, he would, he would resume his, his effort to get weapons of mass destruction. 
And who knows what that would have looked like, what an empowered Saddam Hussein would have looked like, what a potential nuclear arms race between Iraq and Iran to see who could first develop a nuclear weapon would look like, and what that would do to the Middle East. You know, Bush was faced with a difficult choice, either use that military force and replace Saddam Hussein, which was the policy of the United States government at the time, or basically give it up and go home. And he decided he couldn't do the former and had to do the latter. That's why when people talk about Richard Haas, who's a wonderful friend, has made uh, this notion of there are wars of necessity and wars of choice. And I would say to you, one of my life lessons is any time anybody says to you something is either this or that, it's usually wrong, because most of the times it's some of each. And I would say that Iraq, Peter, was not a war of either choice or necessity. It was a war of last resort. We'd exhausted all our options. And the question was, do you let Saddam go free? And the president decided he couldn't do that. I was struck, I'm sure you've read a lot of the commentary, as have I, at the, on the anniversary, and including uh, quotes from Richard Haas in the New York Times, where he says he's, to this day, he can't understand why the president made the decision. He can't explain it. There, but that was the more kind <laughs> quotes in that particular article. The other ones gave, suggested that, well, it was a lie. Bush lied, people died, that, that argument. Uh, and that, peop, that, that the team knew that the intelligence was weak but pushed the war anyway because they wanted the war, they wanted to do a demonstration. Talk a little bit about that that line of argument is there anything to it is there uh, if you did, were you confident in the intelligence for instance or did you think oh, it's dodgy but let's go for it we were confident in the intelligence as it turns out we shouldn't have been but we were confident in it there was a national intelligence estimate that was prepared which uh, then vice president cheney said was the most sort of unvarnished and compelling case he had seen, it turned out to be wrong. And one of the questions people ask is, well, was it intelligence failure and why? And, you know, I think it was uh, an intelligence problem in this sense. It was a failure of imagination. No one came to the president and said, Mr. President, what if this happened? What if Saddam Hussein actually got rid of his stockpiles of, new, of weapons of mass destruction and discontinued his nuclear program in 1991 as the UN told him to do. What if he'd done that but doesn't want the world to know because he just finished a 10 year war with Iran and he doesn't want to let Iran know he doesn't have that kind of protection. In the debriefs of Saddam Hussein after he's captured, that seems to be what was the case. That argument was never made to the president. One of the things that has been done subsequent to, nine, to the decision to go to war in Iraq, the intelligence community now does a lot more of red team. Take a cell of people, put them in a different room and tell them, look for alternative explanations for the facts we see and bring those to the president. We need to do that, but we, the, the, intelligence, the intelligence was wrong. I, I think it's even worse than that. I love saying that to you because he does it all the time. The, in some cases, some of Saddam's own people were lying to him about the progress that they were making in certain sectors, certain research sectors. They were afraid to say to him, we now know because we interviewed them later. Uh, and so he, Saddam Hussein may have thought that he had a more robust program than he actually did have. So that that's how opaque the intelligence well, was. Well, the other piece of it is the military thought he had it. <laughs> they thought he had it. And their question was, as the US forces progressed in Iraq, their question was when he was gonna use the WMD. So he fooled his own military. I think the other issue that comes across is that people say that there was a politicization of intelligence, that the White House and the president and the vice president pressured analysts to change their views. Uh, that was investigated by the Silberman Robb Commission uh, on WMD intelligence, and they concluded that that was not the case. I'll tell you what was the case, and I think it's appropriate. But so the president, President Bush, took intelligence very seriously. And six days a week, he got an in-person briefing by his intelligence briefer 
on the issues of the day. It took about an hour. They'd walk him through. It was a book. He'd read the book, and then he would ask the intelligence analyst questions. And he would push the analysts. And, you know, at one point, you know, we talked to the president and said, you know, you're pushing these analysts. And he said, let me explain to you. And he said it to the analyst who he was pushing at the time. He said, let me tell you, I'm pushing you. I'm not asking you to change your view. I don't want you to change your view, but I need to know what you know, how you know it, and what you don't know, because that tells me how much weight I should put on the views you've just expressed here. I think that's an appropriate interaction between a president and his intelligence analysts. Some people would say, well, the president is putting pressure on the analysts. But if you're the president of the United States and you have to make important decisions that depend in part on intelligence, you've got to push your analysts because you've got to know what they know, how they know it, and how confident they are. Because lives may turn on that, the answer to those questions. The other line of critique, which um, has a lot of traction and may in fact hold up better, even in hindsight, was the critique that says, uh, regardless of the WMD issue, the invasion went well, but then the post-invasion stabilization did not go well and was not well anticipated. The problems that we actually faced were not well anticipated in the pre-war planning. Uh, and so that, that's, a, that's on the president. Can you talk to that issue? Yeah, there's, there's a view that there wasn't much post-war planning. There was a lot of post-war planning. One of the things that fi it would made it difficult is we hadn't been in Iraq for a long time. And we didn't really understand the impact that Saddam Hussein had had on his own people. Um, and a lot of the planning, you know, turned out once we got there, not to be particularly relevant. I think that's true. But the real story is, and this is one, this is our great failing. We could not stabilize the country between 2003 and 2007. Um, and we paid and the Iraqi people paid a huge price for that in terms of lives and treasure of, of the United States and our coalition partners and in terms of lives and way of life of the Iraqis. There's just no way around it. Uh, and it wasn't until the surge announced in January 2007 that, that we really started to make progress. And by the end of the surge, we had defeated Al Qaeda in Iraq. They were still making low level terrorist activity, but they weren't a threat to the Iraqi government. That's on us. It took us four years to figure out how to do that. And the price was, was interesting because uh, when we went into Iraq and six, when we went into Afghanistan and overthrew the Taliban so quickly with only 1,500 or 2,000 American troops on the ground helping the Afghans to throw off the Taliban themselves, and when we were able to topple Saddam Hussein so quickly, we had a lot of credibility. Those wars were both had elements of being about weapons of mass destruction. And simultaneously in that period of time in 2003 when we succeeded in Iraq, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya voluntarily gives up to the British and the United States his weapons of mass destruction program. Why? Because he thinks he's going to be next. And the Iranians who had a covert weapons development program suspend their program. Nuclear. They think nuclear the covert the Iranians. Nuclear, yeah. Yeah, COVID. the Iranian, their nuclear program. Had a covert nuclear program, both a Iranian enrichment program and a bomb making program. And they suspended because they think they might be left. Um, we, in the space of the next two years with the Europeans, reach an agreement with Iran to give up all their nuclear programs. And in September 2005, we reach an agreement with the North Koreans to give up their nuclear programs altogether, civil and military. So it looks like we're running the table on the proliferation problem, but we get bogged down in Iraq and Afghanistan and the countries no longer feel threatened by our military force. And uh, Ahmadinejad is elected president in Iran and gets out of the deal and puts Iran back in their, their nuclear program and the North Koreans walk away from their deal. So we paid enormous price in American credibility for our failure to stabilize Iraq, in addition to all the huge costs in Iraq itself. But that loss of capability cost us in terms of being able to achieve really important objectives for the United States. So let me get back to the book. You handed over the transition notebook 
to President Obama, not President Hillary Clinton, as many people expected might have happened, in part because President Obama had campaigned, had been opposed to the Iraq war from the very beginning, whereas Sec Senator Clinton had not been. So you're handing over the Iraq war to a man who's president because he opposed the Iraq war. Talk a little bit about how the memo deals with that particular challenge to uh, try to explain to him a course of action that, that the team is almost viscerally opposed to hearing, particularly hearing from you all. One of the things we tried to do in the memos was at the president's direction was to try to explain the policies and to try to make it easy if we could for the next administration to accept our policies and continue what we were doing. We tried to do that in Iraq by, and if you read the chapter that's in the book, it talks about the surge and the consequences of her. And the message to President Obama was, this war is largely over for the United States. We've largely won it. Al Qaeda has been defeated in Iraq. Politics is resuming in Iraq. There have been elections. Uh, we can help the Iraqis do what they said they wanted to do after the fall of Saddam Hussein, which is build a secure, prosperous, democratic future. We can help them do it. Uh, the war is largely over. And we reach an agreement with Prime Minister Maliki that the US troops would be gradually reduced and would be all out by 2011. Now, we thought there was probably likelihood that there would be a renegotiation in 2011 and some forces would remain to train the Iraqi forces. But the argument to, to Obama was, the war has largely been won. You have an opportunity to help Iraq build a kind of country in the Middle East where Sunni, Shia, and Kurds are working together for a common future. In a, in a unified country, and that's not typical in the Middle East at that period of time. But uh, President Obama, I think, uh, bought it in part. They uh, flirted with the idea of extending our troop presence in 2011, but that failed to do so. All the troops come out in 2011, and it has a bad effect on Pr Prime Minister Maliki, who becomes more sectarian and politicizes his military, alienates the Sunnis. So when, she, when neighboring Syria descends into civil war and Al-Qaeda reconstitutes itself in Syria as ISIS, in 2014, ISIS moves into the country and takes over 40% of Iraq. And everything we tried to do with the surge was defeated. And President Obama sends American troops back into Iraq notwithstanding his com campaign promises. And those troops helped the Iraqis kick out ISIS and retake the 40% of their territory that ISIS had held and put an end to the, uh, the ISIS caliphate. Those forces are still there, 2,500 of them, doing what we had hoped we would have forces doing in 2011 when we renegotiated the withdrawal helping to train and support the Iraqi security forces to provide security for their own people. So this notion that somehow Iraq was this endless war, it's a war that for us, you know, ended first in 2008, was ratified in 2011 when we left, it was actually won against, against ISIS in 2018, and uh, is, is basically still a security problem for the Iraqis, but not for American troops. And as I say, I think uh, there is a good chance that Iraq is gonna surprise us all and be an example ultimately of a state in the Middle East where Sunni, Shia, and Kurds are working together for a common future. And that's a good, that would be a good outcome. But the cost, I, don't get me wrong, the cost was enormous unnecessary, and a lot of it was chargeable to us. Let me shift now to another chapter in the book that uh, provide or talks about issues that lead to a powerful critique of the Bush administration, a critique from doves, and also a different critique from hawks. I'm referring to the Russia chapter. So the doves would say that the Bush administration laid the seeds for the current problem in Ukraine 
when they pushed for NATO expansion, which uh, antagonized Putin and worried him. And the Hawks would say the Bush administration laid the seeds for this problem when the reaction to the invasion of, U of Georgia was so anemic in 2008. Uh, and thus, Bush, uh, Putin got the sense he could get away with this kind of behavior. So address that double-edged uh, critique, the Bush legacy on Russia and what it says to today. So we're getting into a lot of inside baseball and, I'm not, and I'll try to answer this quickly and then we can get to some questions from the audience. That's my cue to shut up. I, I, I had no <laughs> uh, The Russia that Bush faced was dramatically different than the Russia today. The Bush, Russia Bush faced was relatively weak. Putin was relatively new to the job. Uh, Putin professed that he wanted to bring Russia into the West and build a democratic future for his country. Bush would ask him that and Putin would say, no, no, that's what I want to do. But there are dark forces in Russia and you have to let me do it my own way, in my own time. Um, turns out he didn't want to do it and he didn't do it. And over the course of the eight years as we engaged and it's the chapter in the book shows all the cooperative programs we dealt because we tried to bring Putin and Russia into the West, into the international system, have a deep and productive and cooperative relationship with Russia. And we got a long way. But as we tried to build that Russia, he was becoming more authoritarian at home and in some sense more paranoid abroad. The color revolutions that happened in Ukraine and Georgia and Kyrgyzstan 2004, 5, and 6, we thought were building prosperous democratic states that would be good neighbors for Russia. That's not how Putin saw it. Putin saw it that we were building states that would be anti-Russian and it was a dress rehearsal led by the CIA to destabilize Russia itself. And he takes the advantage of going into Georgia in 2008. Uh, I think it was a reasonable effort to bring Russia into the West. It failed. Countries get to make their own choices and their leaders make their own choices. And Putin made a choice in this case. We, we threw all those cooperative programs into the toilet after he went into Georgia. We moved humanitarian assistance by in military aircraft. We set a ship into the Black Sea. We threatened the possibility of using our military to protect Georgia. In any event, it kept Putin from having his military take Tbilisi and overturn the duly elected government of Georgia. We did everything but impose economic sanctions. We didn't impose economic sanctions because the world was in the midst of the greatest financial and economic crisis since the Great Depression. And that didn't seem like a good time to start piling on sanctions. But we knew we had to make Putin pay a price uh, because we said at the time, if he's not frustrated in Georgia, tomorrow it will be Ukraine and the day after it'll be the Baltic states. And if Putin goes into the Baltic states, since they are members of NATO, that will be a war between Russia and NATO. And that's not a good thing for any of us. So we saw that very clearly, and we tried to, to convince Putin that this was not the right move. So I think it was a reasonable effort to bring Russia into the West. It failed. Putin got to make his own decisions. There's a lot of, he, he has a long list of grievances, missile defense, NATO enlargement, and all the rest. But if you read the speech Putin gave the night before he went into Ukraine the second time in 2022 on February 28th. Yeah, at the back of the speech has the grievances about missile defense and NATO enlargement, but the front of the speech is all about Ukraine is not a real country. Ukraine will not be sovereign unless it is, unless it is part of Russia. And it's clear that, that Putin's goal is not to restore the Soviet empire, but it's to restore the Russian empire within the traditional uh, Russian territories of, of the former Soviet Union. That's his agenda. It is to destroy Ukraine's sovereignty and bring it into and make it part of Mother Russia. That's not about NATO enlargement. That's not about missile defense. It is interesting, by the way, that the only two countries that Putin has gone into, Georgia and Ukraine, 
are the only two countries in that region that are not members of NATO. So while uh, people are getting in line, I think this is the, the um, microphone for you all to use. If you want to ask a question, get in line there. I'm going to ask my last question, which is on China. So uh, some critics, including within the Republican Party, President Trump more or less said this, that China took advantage of President Obama and President Bush, the effort to engage China, basically empower China, and China took advantage of us. Talk a little bit about Bush, the President's Bush's legacy on China. Uh, it's in a similar story in some sense to Russia. Uh, the China that Bush confronted, the China of Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, wanted a benign international environment so they could focus on development. They wanted to be part of the international system, not overturn it. They wanted a cooperative relationship with the United States. Uh, and uh, that's the China we saw. And we thought it was a reasonable bet to try to bring them into the international system. In retrospect, if we had not, and China took the turn that it took, a lot of people would be blaming the Bush administration <laughs> and its hawk and its hawk-like attitudes for alienating China, sort of what Putin argues we did with respect to, to Europe. Um, I think the the change in China is because of Hu Jintao, who had a very different view about the China he wanted than the China of John Zemin or Hu Jintao. It is a China he basically decides. The West is in decline. The United States is in terminal de decline. As the Marxists would say, the coalition, correlation of forces favors China. <clears throat> this is China's moment to step forward center stage. And he's been very aggressive in the use of his military, which he is rebuilding at a pretty alarming rate. He's used economic and diplomacy sanctions to uh, intimidate neighbors, not only neighbors and friends, but countries as far away as Europe. He's got a different agenda. And is an agenda that is based in some sense of offering authoritarianism <clears throat> as an alternative to our model of democracy and free market economies. And it's an agenda to overturn and remake the international order in his image rather than our image. That's the China we face today. Again, you know, <clears throat> countries make their own choices that reflect their politics, but also I would say leaders matter and who leads countries makes a huge difference. And if you don't believe it, <clears throat> look at China under Xi Jinping. And so I say to, to folks, you know, we know from the last several elections, elections in the United States that your vote matters. Few number of votes can actually change the election. Well, I'd also say, whose president matters. So we all have an instance, you should get involved in politics and certainly should vote. So identify yourself and ask your question, please. Hi, Hi. name is Dave Sedor. Uh, uh, as a, someone who voted for Obama twice, I wanna thank you for what in retrospect appears to be a relatively seamless transition from the Bush to Obama administrations, especially looking back at our last transition. Uh, I have two questions. One is looking at the policy recommendations that you did make uh, in the transition memos, uh, what, what do you, which ones do you think uh, were followed through the most by Obama and which ones were followed through the least? And my second question concerns uh, some on the part of some people, uh, it seems like going into Iraq really uh, ended up as a benefit for Iran. So if you would comment Good question. on that. Yep. I'll take the second one first. Uh, it did help Iran. There's no question. Um, and we anticipated it might. <clears throat> but as I say, we went into Iraq, <clears throat> not as some people say, to spread democracy out of the barrel of a gun, but to resolve a real, what we thought was a real national security problem. We believed at the time, and it's actually held up pretty well, that, <clears throat> that for Iraqi Shia 
Iraqi nationalism with Trump sectarian, policy, par, uh, sectarian politics. That is the end of the day. The Iraqi Shia, who were the closest to the Iranians, would actually want to have an Iraq that was run by Iraqis, not by Iranians. And that's been largely true. And one of the reasons it is so important for those 2,500 troops to stay in Iraq, and one of the reasons why this new Shia prime minister leading a Shia coalition, members of which are quite close to Iran, came to the United States and said, I want US troops to stay, is because they are very important for balancing the Iranian influence and helping the Iraqis stand up to Iranian influence so Iraq does not become a wholly owned subsidiary of Iran. Second, on your first question, one of the little secrets about foreign policy is there's a lot more continuity between administrations than you would expect or would think if you heard our politics being debated. So, for example, President Obama basically ran against our policy in Iraq, and yet it is President Obama who sends the troops back into Iraq in 2014. He ran against a lot of things we did to keep the country safe against Al Qaeda terrorists, ends up adopting a lot of those measures uh, once he's in office and once he begins to see the intelligence about the threat. He certainly stepped away from the freedom agenda, which he thought was too associated with the Bush administration. I think that was both understandable but unfortunate. Um, you know, look, they, they made their own mistakes, as administrations always do. But I think, they, uh, I think there was a lot of continuity there, and I like to think the transition process helped make that possible. Great, next. Hello, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Tamara, I'm a public policy major here at Stanford. So my question was regarding earlier, you spoke about how um, Bush I'm is- I have old ears and oh, I'm having trouble- Yeah, talking. sorry. Uh, you spoke about how um, Bush's initial diplomatic strategy was undermined by the fact that countries such as France and Germany and Russia um, in the end did not follow the United States um, strategy, um, but uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France went to the UN to say that the French um, intelligence agencies did not see any evidence of the weapon of mass destruction. So where did that um, dissonance in, in intelligence come from? Um, was it a lucky guess from those intelligence agencies or is it something that the US intelligence agencies missed? And then a second question is, why do you think since the Bush administration has been remembered so unfavorably by the American public when it comes to issues of foreign policy? When it comes to issues of? Foreign policy, um, Iraq and. Well, on the second one, you know, Bush bears the burden of Afghanistan and Iraq who did not come out the way we had hoped they would come out. And I think those are, you know, I think presidents tend to be remembered by wars, particularly wars that did not come out the way they'd hoped. It's just part of it. And one of the purposes of this book is to basically tell to Americans there was a lot more about Bush foreign policy than just Iraq, Afghanistan, and the war on terror. On the intelligence, um, the, the problem is, how do you differentiate between somebody who is got weapons of mass destruction <clears throat> but is trying to prevent you from discovering it, and someone who doesn't have weapons of mass destruction and is trying to prevent you from discovering it. Because what they do to prevent the discovery is the same thing. And that was the dilemma. We read all the efforts to frustrate the inspectors as evidence that he had it. Because as I say, for the failure of imagination, we didn't think Maybe he doesn't have it, but doesn't want the world to know. I don't know how you solve that problem. I don't know how you solve that problem. And uh, we, we thought the intelligence was good, and most of our intelligence partners thought the intelligence was good. And even Iraqis' own military <laughs> thought the intelligence was good, and they had weapons of mass destruction, and it turns out he did not. He had not the stockpiles of weapons of mass destruction that we knew he had as a result of the Gulf War in 1990 and 1991. He didn't have them. 
<clears throat> Richard Moon, thank you for your for coming tonight. Um, you touched on the small American force that is charged with uh, training the Iraqi security people. Um, can you give us a sense of what um, what was behind the decision to demobilize the Iraqi army when we took it over? Because uh, that's contrary to tradition when armies take over other countries, usually they knock off the first couple of layers of administration and then um, incorporate uh, the, the soldiers into their own army. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and it's a complicated history and I'm not gonna do it justice. There are a number of strands to it. One is Jerry Bremer, if he was here, who headed the, the coalition provisional authority would say that he didn't span the Iraqi army, the Iraqi army disbanded itself. And I'll give you an example. We had intelligence in the waning days of the war that there were division level units of the, I think even the Republican Guards, which is the elite Iraqi forces, that were prepared to surrender in mass with their weapons. And indeed our post Iraq planning assumed there, there would be 150,000 Iraqi troops that we could use to help maintain security and order. Well, all of those troops melted away. We didn't have a single Iraqi division. I don't think even a single Iraqi battalion that surrendered with its equipment. So we found ourselves short of the 150,000. And the notion that there was an Iraqi army to be used to maintain order post-invasion went away. I think the question is, once it became clear three or four months after the invasion uh, w was over that uh, an insurgency was building, whether Jerry Bremer should have recalled the Iraqi forces to service, eliminated their top leadership, vetted the colonel level and below and start using them to help maintain order. The problem, I think if he were here, he would say the Iraqi army was hated by the Iraqi people. It was viewed as an oppressive force, particularly a Sunni professive force that was used against Kurds. Remember Saddam Hussein had used chemical weapons against his own Kurdish population. Um, and when the Shi'i rose up in 1990, 1991, he brutally put them down with the Iraqi army. So there is a, a problem with the Iraqi our, army in terms of the, uh, view of that army and its legitimacy in the minds of a good chunk of the Iraqi population. But I think in retrospect, it's pretty clear we should have called the army back. And and uh, that was probably the right call. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rahul Krishnaswamy. I'm an alum of the program. And my question to you is you talked a bit before about continuity between um, presidential administrations of different parties. Um, and for much of recent history, that has been the case. But as political polarization grows in America um, and public opinion kind of turns against the blob, as we saw in the past administration, um, to what extent do you think that'll impact the transition process? Because we saw in the Trump administration that um, a lot of the traditional institutionalist conservatives were replaced towards the end and replaced with much more um, MAGA style populist Republicans, especially at like DOD and the NSC. Um, and that kind of held back some of the transition process, especially when there's debates over calling the election, et cetera. To so what extent do you think that kind of influences or will influence in the future um, transition processes in the years to come? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but you worry about it. I have a guess. I have a guess that Americans even a lot of Trump supporters don't quite like how the transition came, came about in 2020. Don't want to repeat of that. I think it's interesting, uh, you know, for all the support for people, for defeated candidates to say that they're not going to accept the results of the election and they want it and that there is fraud and they want to recount or rerun or whatever. I think only one candidate for governor in Arizona, and I'm blanking on her Carrie name, Carrie, Carrie Lake. I think only one candidate did that as a result of the 2022 election. A lot were very quickly of the losers. Even losers that had been backed by Trump came out very quickly to say, 
they accept the legitimacy of the election and they uh, and they congratulated the the winner i think that's a good development and i think that's an indication that that those politicians read the american people and even in the trump to biden transition there were portions of the trump administration for example like the nsc staff on robert o'brien that really tried to do what we did in terms of our transition and jake sullivan uh, biden's national security advisor has publicly acknowledged that so i think uh, i think a decent respectful transition is uh it's a, if it's a stock i would buy i think it's low but i think it has a good good upside potential here in the years ahead uh, hi, I'm Ian and I'm an undergrad here with the program. Thank you so much for coming to speak. I guess my question is earlier you used the phrase democracy down the barrel of a gun. And yeah. um, do you think that as the view shifted from WMDs to state building as a justification for being in Iraq and then as we became more bogged down, how did that influence Western support for democratic movements more broadly? And do you think it contributed at all to democratic backsliding? That's an interesting question. And um, I don't know the answer. I'll give you a, a view. You know, the, the gist of it is we went into Iraq, removed Saddam Hussein for national security reasons. Yeah. Then the question is, what do you do then? Do you just substitute another democ another dictator who's not going to be as brutal on his people, won't, re won't, <laughs> won't invade his neighbors, and, <laughs> and won't support terror? And the president decided that we should give the Iraqi people an opportunity to build a prosperous, secure, democratic future. It's what they said they wanted. It's what we do as Americans, because that's, those are our values the one country in the world that is based on, organized on, based on a set of principles. But also we thought that a country as diverse in terms of religion, ethnic, and language as Iraq would only stay together in a democratic framework where Sunni, Shia, and Kurds could work together. So that's what we did. I think that the backsliding in democracy is a function of domestic politics of the countries in which it's occurred. If you look at and it tends to be ones where somebody gets elected for power, um, stays too long, the opposition of the country can't get organized to kick them out, and the longer they stay, the more authoritarian they come. Look at the president of Hungary, look at Erdogan in Turkey. Uh, I think that's how it comes. I think in the end of the day, it was a reflection of developments, domestic developments within each country. Last question. Good. Um, my name is Rithika. I'm a senior um, on the student council. And, you know, we've talked a lot about Iraq. We've talked about China. We've talked about Russia. And I'm just curious if you could give us a little bit more about the thinking around Afghanistan when um, the transition happened. You know, was there a sense that the situation could turn into the forever war that we saw? Um, and I'm just curious in terms of, you know, the, the transition and the handoff, what some of the thinking was uh, on that situation. Hold your answer because I didn't realize there's one more. So Jason, you can ask your question and he'll answer both at the same time very quickly. Jason. It's a very different direction. That's okay. He can handle two at a time. Jason. Up at the mic. Could you come to the mic? Because otherwise I won't hear you. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. In a very different direction. So I want to ask you about nukes because it's rare to have a nuclear expert come over and talk to us. Um, so back in 2001, you were on the panel who recommended that the U.S. develop low yield precision guided nuclear weapons or tactical nukes, from my understanding um, that, no, okay. But keep going, keep going. I was reading um, that Russia is currently developing or threatening to use tactical nuclear weapons. China's developing them and upgrading the arsenal. And so, especially um, in regards to Taiwan, how do you see the US employing and deploying um, its tactical nuclear arsenal? And how do you expect Russia and China to use those in both Ukraine and the wars ahead? How, the easier version of that question, so Afghanistan and should the US refresh its tactical nuclear uh, weapons arsenal and strategy? Two very different questions. So Af Afghanistan, um, it's interesting. There's a view out that we bled Afghanistan in order to support the war in Iraq. 
be shortchanged in Afghanistan. And there are a lot of military people who will swear that that's the case. I don't believe it myself. And it's interesting, when we were developing the surge in Iraq, which the president announced in 2007, we were also developing a strategy, a plan to change our strategy and surge in Afghanistan, because we weren't winning that war, it was absolutely clear. And that's what we left, actually, for the Obama administration. We did some of it ourselves, we left the rest for the Obama administration. The Obama administration tried their own surge in Afghanistan, like the surge in Iraq. It did not work, partly because the conditions that made it succeed in Iraq were not present in Afghanistan, partly because the president put a time limit on it, which was not great, because it allowed the Taliban to wait us out. But we did transfer a responsibility to an Afghan force that we trained, and that by, I think it's 2011, 2012, we end combat operations in Afghanistan. We are then in a support role. So this forever war, supposedly, that we're waging in Afghanistan, it comes to an end in 2011, 2012 for us, not for the Afghans, of course, not for the Afghans. Uh, but with our support, the Afghans hold their own on the ground militarily. Where the Afghans lost was politically. We we're not able to help the Afghans succeed in developing a government that was legitimate, had public support, could deliver services, could get the economy going, could conquer corruption, and win the support of the Afghan people. And if there is a lesson about these military interventions, I think there are two lessons. One, if you do not have a legitimate, strong local partner, as you try to help them build a secure, stable, prosperous, democratic state, it's going to be really hard to succeed. And that applies to Afghanistan, sadly. And I'm a big fan of Ashraf, Ashraf Ghani, but that's the reality. Secondly, if there is a country nearby that is providing safe haven to the terrorists and the insurgents, it's going to make it very hard to succeed. We learned that from Vietnam. We learned it again in Afghanistan. Um, my own view is that um, it was unfortunate to negotiate the withdrawal agreement that the Trump administration negotiated, and I say that even though Zal Khalazad, who negotiated, is one of my close friends. Um, but the real problem is we didn't enforce that agreement. We kept bringing down our force levels, even though the Taliban weren't complying with those things that were in the agreement. And that basically told them we were done. And President Biden then pulls the troops out. I don't think it had to end that way, uh, but that's where we are. And the suffering that is now being sustained in Afghanistan, particularly by women and youth, is unspeakable. The Back nukes, the nukes. Yeah. nukes. So here's the, here's the deal. United States, every president comes in and says, I want to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our national security. That's the mantra. The problem is the world's going in the other direction. The Russians have already modernized theirs. The Chinese are modernizing and expanding theirs. By 2035, it's estimated they might have 1,500 strategic nuclear warheads. That's close to what we have. North Korea is building nuclear weapons as fast as they can, and the Iranians, I think, are going to move in, are already moving in that direction, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to stop them. So this is the disconnect. We'd love to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our national security. It's just that, we're, that the rest of the world is going in a different direction. Uh, I think the administration is trying to strengthen extended deterrence, reassure Japan and South Korea that we have their back, with nuclear weapons if necessary, precisely so that we don't have to deploy tactical nuclear weapons in Japan or South Korea, and precisely so that they will not try to build nuclear weapons themselves. That's the lay of the land as I see it. So I think you accomplished three things today. You disrupted, I think, some prejudices or stereotypes people might have held of the Bush administration. You also informed us with a remarkably encyclopedic and broad uh, review of the legacy in various areas. 
and you put me in my place a number of times, uh, the latter being the most popular thing with the audience. But for all of that, we're very much in your debt. Thank you, Steve, for coming. I want to thank the dean who's gone for having me here. I want to thank Peter, who has been was a terrific colleague in the Bush administration and in all things since. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.